You know, Paul, <laughs> when I was a kid, uh-huh. I I was afraid of the dark. And at night, you know, when I'd have to pee, my dad, he would walk me to the bathroom. He was He's a great guy, Paul. And that's why, Paul, I call him. <laughs> and that's why he's the number one dad. <laughs> that is, without question, the best one of those that we've done ever. Uh, yeah. The kids were really <laughs> laughing at that one when I told it to I mean, them tonight. it's solid. It's, yeah. <laughs> well, that would be the number two dad, Paul. <laughs> uh I was trying to think of a way to fit that in, too. The Curbsiders Podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. Furthermore, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of the host and should not be interpreted to reflect the official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash like more hospital and affiliate outreach programs, if indeed there are any. In fact, there are none. Pretty much, we are responsible if you screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know when we're wrong. Welcome back to the Curbsiders. I'm Dr. Matthew Wado, uh, d- and we it's its really silly after that pun, Paul. Uh, on tonight's episode, we're going to be talking about chronic kidney disease with everyone's favorite nephrologist, our, our chief of Cashlack, Dr. Dr. Joel Toff. Before we, we tell him about, we tell the audience about Joel, Paul, can you remind them, what is it that we do on the Curbsiders? Sure. As a reminder, we are the internal medicine podcast. We use expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. And as you say, we have uh, 17 time guests. Do we calculate Dr. Joel Top just catching us up on all that there is to do with, with chronic kidney disease, which is perpetually changing and always kind of daunting to me until after I hear him talk. Yeah. So we're going to talk about uh, SGLT2 inhibitors. We're going to talk about phenarinone. Uh, potassium binders and metabolic acidosis. Joel just has so many great pearls. Uh, for people who haven't heard him before, he is a practicing nephrologist. He's on Twitter all the time. He is the creator of Nef Madness and one of the co-creators of uh, co-creators of Nef Madness and Nef Journal Club and the Freely Filtered podcast. Uh, and he's he's always just been our, the audience's, I would say, dare I say, favorite guest on the Curbsiders, uh, or certainly most requested guest. So if you haven't heard him before, uh, without further ado, let's get to the interview. And before we do that, Paul, I should remind the audience that this and most episodes are available for CME for all health professionals through VCU Health at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. Dr. Toff did mention that he has been on advisory boards for Bayer, who is the maker of Phenarinone, and AstraZeneca, who is the maker of Depagliflozin. Um, However, we did try to keep the discussion fair and balanced, and we avoided trade names uh, and discussed a, like I said, balanced range of therapeutic options. Joel, you're... You're you're welcome back to the show. This is what your twentieth time on the show. I don't think like it's that. quite twenty, but it's it's been it's, a great run. Yeah, it's definitely. I think we're in the high teens here. Um, so we we are going to get right into some cases today because we have a lot to talk about. All right, Paul. So let's get right into it here with a case from Cashlack. All right, Joel, we have for you Mr. Morris, a 64-year-old gentleman with a history of high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, hyperlipidemia, and chronic kidney disease. He is currently on losartan, amlodipine, hydrochlorothiazide, metformin, and atorvastatin. Mr. Morris's hemoglobin A1c is 7.6 and his EGFR is 30. Urine albumin creatinine ratio is 120. The blood pressure in the office is 139 over 85. Mr. Morris has recently moved cities. He's establishing care with you as his primary care physician at Cashlack. And so this is the patient for whom... We would obviously think about an SGLT2 inhibitor, and I, I'd like to hear from you, Joel, uh, as we start, what kind of calculus goes into your decision to start an SGLT2? Yeah. So Mr. Morris is kind of a, a prototypical patient for an SGLT2 inhibitor. Kind of when I see these patients on their first visit, one of the things that I make the centerpiece of my discussion is I do a uh, renal failure uh, risk equation. And I've talked about this on the, or excuse me, the kidney failure risk equation. I've talked about this on the curbsiders before. And essentially, this takes the GFR, the age and gender of the patient, whether they're North American or not, and then tells you what their likelihood of needing dialysis. And so, um, and so when I did this for Mr. Uh, 
uh, Moore, is that his name? Mr. Morris, Mr. M- Mr. Morris. Um, his albumin to creatinine ratio is 120. He comes out with a, um, a two-year risk of dialysis of 5% and a five-year risk of dialysis of 15%. And this is the kind of thing I think, it, and this to me is so much more helpful than saying this guy is CKD stage 3B or saying he's orange on the KD go heat map. And people are like, I don't know, orange doesn't seem good, but what do I do with that? And when you tell them, you know, here, here we're looking at a 15%, kind of a one in six chance of you being on dialysis in the next five years, their eyes kind of pop and they're like, oh, okay, that's a, that, that makes it real for people. And they can kind of start to, you know, and I, and that makes it real for me too. It helps me kind of, you know, think about, okay, what are we doing and how can we help this guy? And, you know, unfortunately there's not usually a lot we can do for the serum creatinine. And I really kind of focus in on that albuminuria is kind of the modifiable risk factor. What kind of things can we do? And, you know, table stakes, the first thing that you're going to do, especially for patients with diabetes, is going to use RAS inhibition. So you're going to you start them up on an angiotensin receptor blocker or an ACE inhibitor. And he's already on, which he on lisinopril or losartan. So you're gonna, he's, a, he's on losartan. Um, so you'd want to make sure that's maximized. Right. So for Los Harden, that's a like hundred milligrams. I like, um, I listen to the curbsiders and they had this great episode with Jordy Cohn. And she said, she doesn't like Los Harden. She likes, uh, Talmus Harden. And so I do whatever Jordy tells me. And so I, t- <laughs> if his blood pressure actually looks, doesn't look terrible. It's not quite at goal. 139 over 85 is a little rich. I'd want to work that down. And, and one of the things I would do about that would be switching him uh, from Losartan to Telmosartan and, and switch him from hydrochlorothiazide to chlorthalidone, which is a more effective thiazide-like diuretic. Okay, because we're really looking for blood pressures in the 120s here. And the reason the reason she doesn't like Losartan as much is because it's a shorter-acting medication, so should be dosed twice a day, but like Olmosartan, Telmosartan, Candesartan, those ones are longer-acting. She said Valsartan is a oh, little so bit of short. a weaker agent. Yep. But yeah, but Valsartan is a little weaker. That's another reason she doesn't use that one. So yeah, I mean, uh, this... The, so this this patient is at risk. So you're saying like, I think we talked to, uh, when we were talking to Tapper about liver, he said like the bilirubin is like, that's where he he looks at that bilirubin, that's how anxious he gets about somebody's liver disease. So it sounds like you're saying this proteinuria, albuminuria, that, that kind of raises your level of worry about a patient. Absolutely. Right. And again, it's the modifiable one. So the one that you're going to be able to make an, uh, a, a change with by changing the medications and, and, get, and getting his blood pressure down and getting his, um, and getting, and, and changing agents. And so the next question was the SGLT2 inhibitor. And so that's a, that's a great, that's a great option for these guys that we have, we've got study after study. And he's kind of the prototypical patient that's been enrolled. Um, his GFR is 30 and, and pretty much um, every single one of the uh, studies that looked at that at, that enrolled patients with chronic kidney disease enrolled people down to a GFR of thirty. Now, a few of them have gone below that, right? So, you know, this is a question I get: is how low can you go when you start uh, an SGLT two inhibitor? And so, kind of the first wave of these studies, uh, EMPA Reg, which is the uh, Empagal Flows and Outcome Study, uh, Canvas. Uh, which was the um, canagliflozin outcome study, and Credence, which was the very first um, CKD-specific study, enrolled people down to a GFR of 30. DAPA-CKD, which was dapagliflozin, looking for chronic kidney disease outcomes, they enrolled people down to 25. And then just this past fall, we pub- uh, EMPA kidney was published that enrolled patients down to a GFR of 20. And so, you know, that's kind of like the the lowest that we've gone up to now. Um, but the, all those studies have been positive, right? Not, none of them showed any decrease effectiveness at low GFR. And so, we're comfortable enrolling patients, uh, starting patients on SGLT2 inhibitors down to a GFR of 20. Now, one of the things that I'm a little worried about with this guy is uh, a GFR of 30 in metformin is kind of on the edge for me. I'm okay with that, but I know I'm going to drop his GFR a little bit further when I start the um, SGLT2 inhibitor. And I think I'd want to probably get him off that metformin if we were going to go there. And so this is something I'd probably, right? So this is something I'd probably want to coordinate with his primary care doctor, say, hey, I think he really does need uh, the SGLT2 inhibitor. And I don't know, his GFR very well could fall down to 26 
which would be you know ten percent drop, and that wouldn't that wouldn't bother me at all. But that would make me a little uncomfortable rolling with that metformin still. And right. So that would that would be something that where I'd want to coordinate with this PCP and say, hey, can we switch them off this? Is there something else that we could use? Yeah. So Paul, because this uh, this is good good information, new information for me because I I always thought that you know once people are enter that CKD four territory that probably we shouldn't be using those. I don't know what you've been doing, but this has been a a point of concern for me. That was the point I wanted to, to clarify or at least emphasize. It sounds like we historically have been wary of those numbers because it had not been studied, not because there's some sort of catastrophic outcome that had occurred with them. And now we've actually had trials that have started a little bit lower and it seems like we're we're feeling more and more comfortable with that. So we've not, the evidence is not there to support us just, just because it hadn't been studied was more the unease, if I'm understanding this correctly. Is that fair to say, Joel? Yeah, I, I mean... All the cases of metformin-associated lactic acidosis I have seen have been patients that developed acute kidney injury. It's never been the slowly progressive, stable CKD when they finally crossed some imaginary GFR line that got into trouble with metformin-associated lactic acidosis. Oh, I, and I was I was actually that that was a little bit of a, it's actually that that's a valid point. My I was thinking of with the SGLT2 inhibitors, like I. I, because in, in the past on the show, we had talked about them, I think when they were new and, and the, I think our guest, it might've been Jeff Colburn was saying, you know, we're not really sure if they'll work for diabetes once you get to that EGFR under 30. So, but the point about metformin, totally valid and uh, also very important to this discussion. So it, now that, now that we're more comfortable using the SGL to SGLT2s at that lower EGFR, even when they drop below 20, you're saying you would initiate, even if they're above 20, like they're EGFR 22, you would initiate it. What if they, six months later, are down to an EGFR 15? You you, you let it ride there? Yeah, yeah. So um, in the big trials, uh, the, the CKD trials, they had a number of patients that go on dialysis. And the way the trials were designed, they never stopped the drugs. So these, they had patients that were in enteric renal failure on dialysis, still taking study drugs, half of them or more than half of them on placebo because unfortunately, or fortunately the drugs work. So most of the people that ended up on dialysis were on placebo, but there were some patients on study drug that ended up on dialysis and they stayed on study drug, right? They stayed on their flozins and there's been a post-hoc analysis and said, you know what? It still was cardioprotective even in the dialysis patients. That's kind of a wow. I wish I could give a reference for that. So that that is in the introduction to a study called the Life Cycle trial that's enrolling right now. And Life Cycle is mm -hmm. a super. It's kind of you know if you kind of look at the history of SGLT2 studies, we've been kind of checking off different populations. And the lifestyle is going to pick up three different populations we haven't studied: one, GFR is less than twenty; two, transplant patients; and three, dialysis mm -hmm. patients that are still making urine is what it was the criteria for that. And so it'll be interesting when that study comes out, because we'll get, we'll knock off, at least look at how these drugs work in populations that really haven't been tried in placebo controlled trials before. But in the introduction, in the, in the kind of the, some of the publications, it's actually uh, the trials.gov. It says, it talks about what happened to these patients in uh, DAPA CKD that, uh, went on dialysis and showed the cardioprotective effect. Amazing. Wow. But uh, what you were saying about the hypoglycemic effect, I, I think that's absolutely true. You get very little hypoglycemic effect as that GFR falls below 45, and it really just becomes nephro and cardioprotective at those lower GFRs, but you're not going to get much benefit for your A1C. Yeah. And the, the funny thing about the the some of the initial trials with these is like the A1C didn't budge much and they still saw the benefit, which was, which was very telling about these medications, as opposed to the the older drugs where they they really did budge the A one C. Maybe they even made it too low, and they still didn't see those benefits. So right. that's why that's how we knew we were onto something with these with these ones. Joel, I wanted to ask about about the degree of proteinuria or albuminuria. What do you what do you tell patients about that? I mean, you have someone on a RAS inhibitor. And we're we're pushing up the dose of that, and then you start someone on an SGLT two. What what can we expect if we're the primary care and someone has in, has like hundred albuminuria, one hundred twenty six, whatever we gave you for this case? What do you, what might happen there? Yeah, I mean, I think you can you, you're looking for about a thirty percent reduction is kind of typical with these drugs. Mm -hmm. um, 
Uh, but there's a lot of variability there, and you'll have some patients that'll get a real dramatic effect, and some people get a more modest effect on that. Um, you know, there are, when you're t- treating an individual patient, it's all N of one. You're always like, and there's a little bit of variability in these studies in terms of, or excuse me, there is variability in uh, uh, albumin to creatinine ratio that you'll just see patients with no real changes having pretty wild swings in that. And you kind of got to step back and kind of look at larger trends to kind of get a sense of what it is. But yeah, you'll see, you'll see a 20 to 30% reduction in that albumin area. And some patients get more dramatic effects. I, I did see in your slides, and I mean, Paul, we've talked about this. I don't, I don't know, Paul, do you still get nervous if someone has an A1C of 13% and you're thinking about starting an SGLT2? Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I So, Joel, do you, do you have any guidance about that? Do you worry if you're starting someone and they're really uncontrolled diabetes at that time? Yeah. I mean, I think what you want to step back and you say, what are we using this drug for? Like, and I think you nailed it, Matt, when you said these are not great uh, hypoglycemic drugs. This is not what you're using to try to get their A1C to target. And so uh, once you're saying, okay, that's not what I'm using it for, don't bring it in when they have the really poor glycemic control. Those patients are going to get a tremendous amount of osmotic diuresis. And those are the patients that start feeling faint, getting big drops in their blood pressure, can develop AKI when they start the drug. It's not common, but those are the patients where you're going to encounter that. And mm. what you're really trying to do is you want this, this drug to be as smooth and as easy to take. And honestly, when patients are relatively well-controlled, A1C is less than 10. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying they're perfect, but reasonably well-controlled. You, they take these medications and you ask them, well, did you feel any different? They don't notice anything. Hmm. And that's what you want. You're like, hey, this is a pill that's as easy to take as placebo. And um, and in fact, in all the big trials, they the, they never let they never enrolled patients with A1Cs higher than 10 or 10 and a half, I think. And so you're just kind of trying to imitate those trials because they had such phenomenal results with such minimal side effects. Yeah. And we've also talked in the past about the you know, concern for euglycemic DKA, if right. it's a patient who's, you know, catabolic and insulin deficient, you, you, you got to be careful with them in those cases. Um, so this, this kind of naturally leads to the question. I mean, we're talking about osmotic diuresis from, from putting someone on these agents. I, when we first started talking about them, we were talking about, okay, if someone's on a loop diuretic, it seems like for whatever reason, you don't have to touch the loop diuretic. Initially, I think some people were pulling off the thiazide-like diuretics if you were starting an SGLT2. Where does the practice with that stand now at, at this point? Guidelines tell you that you need to be cautious, especially in patients that are prone to volume depletion. And then those guidelines also don't tell you who's prone to volume depletion and how to detect <laughs> right. yeah, that. Of course. So, um, and so I think, you know, what you're describing is, you know, I'm going to be cautious if patients are on high doses of diuretics. But in the end, I'm using this in a lot of patients with heart failure. Okay. And they had a lot of these patients that were had heart failure that were enrolled in the cardiovascular trials. And in none of those protocols did they stop the diuretics, hold the diuretics when they started the drug. And those patients did fine. And so, you know, again, patients in trials tend to be healthier than typical patients, right? They're being selected for that so that they can be compliant with the the trial. And so maybe you take that with a little bit of a grain of salt, but my pattern has been, I don't stop the diuretics. I just roll this drug in. Okay. And I suppose, you know, um, a little caution in the patients we talked about, the people with high A1Cs, those are people that you'd want to be a little bit more cautious with and patients where, and I'm also, I don't start these when I'm also initiating the diuretic right? I want to make sure they're on a stable dose of diuretic. And so awesome. oftentimes I'll have patients come in and they have a lot of a lot of edema. This is not the time to start the SGLT2 inhibitor. Let's get the diure- di- edema taken care of. Let's get the hypertension taken care of. Once we're on a stable dose of diuretic, then we can go with this. Um, over time, patients that were randomized to SGLT2 inhibitors tended to be uh, have lower doses of diuretics over time. And that's probably just from better heart failure management, I would imagine. Joel, can you speak to this? The, the risk of urogenital infections, I, I will say in my own personal practice, the number one reasons patients have just decided to not take these medications anymore is because I was I gave them a vulvovaginal candidiasis or rip raging balanitis. Sort of what what kind of counseling does it look like and how how much an increased risk are these patients for when you start the, the flozins for them? 
Yeah. So, I mean, so I think the first thing is um, calling it a mycotic genital infection sounds way worse than I think the reality is. And I, <laughs> and I think that that's, that I try to avoid that language. And so uh, for women, I talk about yeast infections and they tend to, you know, light up like, oh, I understand what you're talking about. And for men, I talk about jock itch. And again, they light up and they understand what I'm talking about. Um, and then for the other one is, is UTIs, which I think has been really blown way out of proportion. Um, yeah. cause I think they were conflated, right. And th they shouldn't be. And so the UTI risk in most of the studies was not apparent at all in the most recent meta analysis that came out in Lancet in 20 end of 2022, they found, I think it was like an 8% increase in, uh, in UTIs. And so, you know, I kind of like, that means if a person gets a UTI uh, three times a year, it would take four years for them to have one extra UTI. Like for a drug that saves your life, uh, prevents hospitalization, prevents death, that seems like a pretty good trade. Um, the, the delta on mycotic uh, genital infections is about three and a half. So that's more significant. But I mean, uh, it's, there's not great epidemiologic data on um, yeast infections, but it looks like 50% uh, of women have a lifetime risk. 75% if, if it, it, of women will get one, at least one uh, uh, yeast infection in their life. And I think it's 50% of those, of that 75% will have a recurrence. So this is not a super common condition, right? And so if you're looking at uh, you know one in 35 years, okay, with this drug, it'll be one in 10 years not terrible. Um, and again, for a drug that has pretty significant upside. Uh, and again, I, and, and I think that's the importance of using that renal failure risk equation, kidney failure risk equation at the very yeah. beginning is like, make it clear what we're trying to avoid here, right? We're talking about dialysis being tied to a machine for uh, a number of years before you pass on, right? That's just not, that's a horrible, that's a horrible outcome. And so avoiding that is kind of the centerpiece of why patients come to see me. And it, when you kind of put these risks in, in that kind of perspective, people are accepting them. And the rest, to, to round out the risks, I mean, it just seems like the, I mean, they remove the warning from canagliflozin for the amputations, right? Yeah. Fournier's gangrene is, seems to be pretty, pretty rare. Super and rare. You already mentioned UTI. And then what about AKI? And, and, you know, that will lead into the question about monitoring when you start patients on these. Right. So, uh, AKI looking for risk of acute kidney injury. Uh, this was done very carefully in DAPA CKD and EMPA kidney. These are the two most recent kidney outcome trials. Mm -hmm. And they actually found lower risk of AKI on the drug, on, uh, the SGLT2 inhibitor, which is, pretty amazing, right? Because yeah. this is, I mean, we're so used to seeing, thinking of them as, oh, they're kind of like ACE inhibitors, or they're kind of like angiotensin receptor blockers. And we know those patients are more likely to develop AKI. And in this case, flip that around, and they had a significantly lower risk of AKI. Um, and so that's pretty amazing. And, and again, I think it just goes to the show that these drugs really do help heal the kidney. You mentioned they have a drop in EGFR, and I, I don't know, Paul, for me, I've been checking because I just feel like it's a diuretic. So I, I usually, anytime I start diuretic, Paul, I, I check in two to four weeks, I, I get a, a metabolic panel. I'm not sure if your practice is the same, and I want to hear what Joel's going to say. But So what do you, what's your timing for starting a new ACE inhibitor for getting a metabolic panel? It's about two to four weeks, usually. Two to four. So you, you essentially, you've kind of adopted the ACE inhibitor Essentially, model yeah. for the for the SGLT2 inhibitor, yeah. So, um, so the, the, this does have people do drop their GFR, but the I think the critical piece of information is uh, the people that drop their GFR do just as well get just as much of a benefit from the drug as the people that don't drop their GFR. So it's not a signal that you need to stop the drug, mm -hmm. right? And so that's a, that's one thing. And then the other one in Epic Kidney, when they designed the trial, they didn't have they started the drug. They didn't even have anybody come back for two months. Like this is the protocolized approved by IRB. <laughs> right. the, the answer wow. is we don't care. Let them go. And so, cause they, they didn't see any reason to intervene. It's not like they develop hyperkalemia. The AKI is not progressive. You're not identifying patients that don't benefit from it. Let it roll. And so 
I am not starting the drug early. I do tell them to call here if you get any symptoms from the drug. If it's if you feel like it's not doing you well, let's talk. But other, other than that, I don't schedule a visit or a lab. All right. That's good. That, that's one less thing to do. <laughs> I mean, that's... Well, and, and that's that to me is what's so great about these drugs is they're kind of set it and forget it, right? You take a look at everything you need to do to treat blood pressure, get glycemic control, manage hypercholesterolemia. Those are super complex that need a lot of skills, lots of intensive lab testing, adjusting of medication, selecting the right agents. This is pick one that's covered by their insurance, start the drug. There's no dose titration. There's nothing. Wow. Okay. And that, and then you check a UA and you can assure compliance, right? Because you they come back in you know three months and you take a look at that UA and it's got five hundred of glucose. You're like, uh, yeah, you're on the drug. I think we covered a lot of territory, it, and it's always good to be reassured about the medications too. That's always nice. They're they're still to me feel relatively new. So just to to hear once again, they're they're largely safe and we don't have to be too too nervous about them. Always feels nice. Two things that I that that I have found when I'm counseling patients about these drugs. So one, I don't say they're new medications, right? These drugs have been out since 2013. These been out, they've been out, we have a decade of experience with these drugs. What I say is we newly, we have, we have a new understanding of these drugs. These drugs have been around for a bit, and now we're beginning to understand that these are the most powerful kidney protective medicines ever discovered and among the most powerful cardiac protection, heart protective medications ever discovered. One pill, and you get both of these benefits. Um, and then the other thing is I say that they are, they come from apple bark and I don't know why people like to hear this. <laughs> people love this. <laughs> so to recap with these, we, we want them first on a stable dose of their diuretics. Uh, we want to make sure the A1C is not super out of control. So less than 10, 10 and a half percent, uh, should be okay to, to tr put them on these. They're set it and forget it. So you don't have to go chasing metabolic panels unless you're doing it for some other reason, but not, not specifically for these. They didn't do that in the trials. Most of the initial concerns about these scary side effects, AKI, gangrene, amputations, you know, have not really panned out. And it's really the yeast infections and the jock itch, as you, as you put it to your patients, that is what patients you can you can counsel patients about. And I think those are. Those are most of the high points and that these are really great for reducing kidney events and uh, helping to reduce albuminuria, which is the and the real reason we're, we're using them. So these are really becoming more kidney and heart drugs than they are diabetes medications. Yeah. And the only the other thing, the thing I would finish off with is don't worry so much about the GFR, especially if it, after they've started it, it can drop down below. You don't need to stop it. It's not like the metformin where you need to worry about it when the GFR gets low. You can roll, roll with these drugs all the way to dialysis. Beautiful. Uh, all right. So, uh, Paul, let's let's move on to our second case here. Sure. We're going to tell Joel about Ms. Houston, who is a 74-year-old woman with a history of hypertension, type 2 diabetes, and CKD. She is on empagliflozin, lisinopril, amlodipine, corthalidone, metformin, insulin, and atorvastatin. Um, we let the metformin ride with an EGFR of 25. The A1C is 7.5. Her potassium is 4.7. You're not being creatinine ratio is 350. The blood pressure in the office is 129 over 79. We are considering considering adding phenerinone to her regimen. Um, <laughs> so I like this first question. What what is phenerinone? I mean, I'm thinking about it, but I don't know what it is. So if you could just sort of talk me through why I might think about that medication for this particular patient, that would help, and then we can delve deeper into it. Okay. So uh, just a little bit of catch up history. You guys remember your basic renal hormones, and you've got. Uh, uh, angiotensinogen that is converted by uh, renin to angiotensin 1, which is converted by angiotensin converting enzyme to angiotensin 2. And angiotensin 2 is biologic, very biologically active throughout the kidney and throughout the vasculature as a vasoconstriction. And it causes a lot of salt retention. And one of his things is it stimulates the release of aldosterone, which then retains sodium, kicks out potassium, and then has some pro-fibrotic activity in the kidney and the heart. And so a lot of our modern therapies for heart failure and kidney disease is kind of to block aldosterone. And we do a lot of that through ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers. And people said, wow, what if we combine them both? What if we use ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers? And that turned out to be a bad idea 
right? That didn't work out nearly as well as we had hoped. It reduced the protein, but increased hyperkalemia and acute kidney injury and didn't seem to have an effect on kidney outcomes. And then we'll and then there was also direct renin inhibitors, and we also, excuse me, then there was also direct renin inhibitors. This is alescarin was the drug. And when we combined that with ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers, we ran into the exact same problem, acute kidney injury, hyperkalemia, and that trial was stopped early. I think that trial was called altitude. And then there was combining ACE inhibitors with aldosterone antagonists, so spironol- spironolactone or eplerinone. And this has been successful in some cases, right? So we definitely have heart failure data where they're combining aldosterone antagonists and ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers because that's just standard of care. And so the most famous one is the RALS trial. And then Ephesus was another one of those big trials. Top Hat was a trial. And these were, you know, there were significant amounts of hyperkalemia with this, but largely they were successful at slowing heart failure progression but they never did a study looking at renal outcomes using um, uh, mineral corticoid uh, antagonists and ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers. People have kind of looked at the the placebo-controlled mineral mineral corticoid receptor antagonist trials to see if there was a kind of a kidney signal kind of buried in that heart failure data, and they really couldn't see that one. They didn't seem to, nothing kind of panned out. But if you did prescribe these two drugs in patients that did have kidney disease, usually you were forced to stop because of hyperkalemia. Phenarinone is a novel mineral corticoid receptor antagonist. It is non-steroidal. It actually looks more like a calcium channel blocker than it does look like uh, a t- t- traditional MRA. And, um, and it blocks the mineral corticoid receptor activity. It seems to have a shorter half-life, and people thought that may be advantageous for hyperkalemia. It doesn't seem to have nearly as much effect on blood pressure, not no effect on blood pressure, but less effect than you see with spiro um, is typically what it's compared to. And uh, and so um, the manufacturer of this drug, uh, Bayer, did two trials, one a cardiovascular trial, and then another one a CKD trial. And they enrolled multi-thousands of patients to uh, finerinone or placebo. They ran it for multiple years. I think uh, the uh, the CKD trial was called Fidelio, and it ran for 2.6 years. And the cardiovascular outcome was Figaro, and it ran for 3.4 years. And both trials were positive. It had a significant effect at reducing the composite outcome. For kidney disease, that composite outcome was death, dialysis, or a 40% reduction in EGFR. And that's kind of an FDA-established finish line for CKD drugs. If you can reduce That's that outcome. Make, right? Like the major oh, ad- major, kidney major events. That's awful. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> just trying to catch up the cardiologist. That is a, that is a tragedy. <laughs> this is this is a pattern. I, I what I was on the in a Twitter conversation the other day where people were saying instead of having CKD3, we should call it a CKD with preserved renal function. <laughs> 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 I like it. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not... <laughs> I can't with it. We'll be here like Kikitaperf and stuff in the clinic, and I can't. I just don't. I don't have this. Kikitaperf. Yeah, I was. I was Kikitaperf. just trying to go there, Paul. I was. I was trying to put something together. You beat me to it. <laughs> so uh, and so it, it, so for that composite outcome. So uh, it, death, dialysis, and a 40% reduction in EGFR, most of the people got there from that 40% reduction in EGFR. You can see that being an easier yeah. line to cross than uh, death or dialysis. Um, but for that composite outcome, it had a, a hazard ratio of 0.82, so about 18% reduction. So you know, just under one in five patients, probably closer to one in six patients benefited, but this is for 2.6 years. Right. That's so, you know, so if you're like, oh, it's a number needed to treat us, you know, um, well, that's a number needed to treat about 33 uh, to get one reduction of that outcome. But, you know, the thing about number needed to treat is it's limited for that time period of the study. And, you know, if you have a patient in, the, in your office who's 50 years old, you're like, well, how many, how many 2.6 year follow ups are they going to have in their lifetime? Right. They're going to have eight or 12 of those. Yeah. And so, you kind of, and it's not clear we could truly stack them, but I think that's a kind of situation where number needed to treat kind of falls down. 
when you really and you got to think about the cost as well of adding this you know the the patient's got to take this medicine we have to monitor their potassium and the cost of it it logistically how how has it been to try to prescribe this as a nephrologist i don't know many primary care doctors are are using this yet yeah so i mean you know it it's it's new to the clinic I, i've i've prescribed it a handful of times um I think mainly what I'm doing when patients are coming in is first, I want to get them started on an ACE inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blocker is what I usually uh, reach for. Uh, then I want to um, I get them on an SGLT2 inhibitor. Then I cycle back to the ACE inhibitor and make sure it's maximized, right? There's no di- dose titration with the SGLT2 inhibitors. You put them on a dose and you're done. But getting them on the SGLT2 inhibitor actually gives them a little bit more headroom for their potassium. And so that'll, that'll that at that point, I ramp up the ACE inhibitor to the maximum tolerable dose. And one of the things that was kind of unique about uh, Figaro and Fidelio is they were very nervous about people saying, oh, you were only able to cross the finish line with this drug because you didn't get them on maximal ACE inhibition. And so they actually spent up to 16 weeks in a, um, in a placebo uh, run-in where all they did was maximize the ACE inhibition. Four months of just maximizing the ACE or angiotensin receptor blocker. And so unlike most trials where they just say they're on maximal drug, <laughs> they actually really pushed it, made sure they were on a- maximal drug before they got enrolled. And so I kind of say, well, if that's how they did the trial, that's what I'm going to do. Once I have them on the a- uh, SGLT2 inhibitor, once I have them on maximal RAS inhibition, I, uh, I take a look at their blood pressure. Right, because these drugs are not great blood pressure uh, uh, drugs, and if their blood pressure is still not controlled, I'm probably going to reach for uh, a, a spironolactone or a nepleurin, a drug that uh, has better blood pressure track record. Um, and these are and and you know CKD is one of the most common causes of resistant hypertension. Which is, you know, quote, quote secondary causes of hypertension is going to be chronic kidney disease, and we know that the, that spironolactone is a great drug there. And so that's usually, if their blood pressure is still not controlled, potassium looks okay, that's what I would add. However, blood pressure controlled, maximal ACE on an SGLT2 inhibitor, and they still have residual proteinuria, I'm going to reach for, uh, or at least talk to them about finerenone at that point. So you're saying that the finerenone has a better track record for someone with residual albuminuria than somebody if then giving spironolactone or a plerinone? What I'm saying is that they they were able to cross the finish line in these, these two trials, Finer, uh, Fidelio and Figaro. And Got it. Not, they haven't been able to really show that with the other drugs. Right. Oh, okay. Got and it. so if and you know if I have you know, pretty significant blood pressure that still needs to be treated. I'm not going to be reaching for finerone. I, you know, they did the study. It didn't have much of an effect on blood pressure. It's not going to be the drug that I'm going to reach for. Um, but if their blood pressure is controlled by other means or what have you, they still have residual proteinuria. And I'm looking at a patient, you know, I do that calculation and like, you know, 15%, 20% uh, risk. I actually calculated for this woman. This woman has a 10% two-year risk of dialysis and a 26% five-year risk of dialysis. And she's already on uh, uh, ACE inhibitor. She's already on SGLT2 inhibitor. And she's going to ask you, well, what, what else can we do? Are we just going to sit here and wait for that to happen? Hmm. You know, those, those are pretty significant risks. I said, actually, there's another thing we can do. Yeah. So this is a highly selected group. And well, Paul and I were talking about this ahead of time. I think one of the criticisms of Fidelio, it seemed like, is that they they had to screen a lot of patients to get the patients for the trial. Yeah, I th- I think knowing going in, they knew that potassium was going to be a problem, and and one of the entry criteria is they had to have a potassium less than four point eight, which is kind of it's kind of bonkers, right? That's a totally normal potassium. A four point nine <laughs> is a normal potassium. They're like, no, no, your potassium is too high for this drug, and it's in the normal range, right? They that's right. They built in a buffer for them, so they so. These were patients that after they maximized their ACE inhibitor, their potassiums were still not only normal, but have a little bit of room. They're not touching the ceiling or even close to the ceiling before they got enrolled. And despite that, despite that, they still had significant um, hyperkalemia. They had uh, 22% of patients on finerenone get to a potassium greater than 5.5 and 5% get to a potassium greater than 6. And that was with about 11% of patients on potassium binders. So they were 
pretty aggressive. And then I think there was like 70% of patients on diuretics. So they were, they were doing everything they could to keep patients on the drug. Um, and they were still running into quite a bit of hyperkalemia. And so that's a, that's a, an important consideration. Absolutely. And we're going to talk about hyperkalemia next. I, I don't think we're quite done with finerenone just, just yeah. yet. Paul, Paul, did you have any other questions about this? I, you're, I want to, I want to hear you talking more tonight, Paul. You're. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people don't need to hear me. I, I'll just come in for the snide comments every so often. No, no, no specific questions have been covered already for me, Matt. Okay. So what we, so what we've talked about so far with this is that um, the spironolactone and plerinone, the, they are better for blood pressure control. So if you know if you're at the point where you're thinking about adding. Um, a mineral out, an MRA, let's say, uh, whether it's non-steroidal like finerenone or one of the older MRAs. Uh, if blood pressure is your tiebreaker, you might go with the older agents. But if if it's just uh, if you're just trying to reduce that albuminuria, you might go with the finerenone in that case, knowing that hyperkalemia could be an issue. Uh, Dr. Cohen, Jordy Cohen, gave us you know patient CKD four. She's comfortable if it's a stable potassium up to 5.5. Joel, do you have a threshold for when you would stop one of these agents? Like if they go above 5.2, they go above 5.5, where do you set that threshold? Um, if I see that little H next to the potassium, I kind of feel the need to intervene. <laughs> I, I, oh, good. I, me too. I, I, yeah, I've become a lot less brave as my, as my career has progressed, because it's just, it doesn't take many calls in the middle of the night of a patient saying, Hey, my primary care doctor just called me and told me to go to the emergency medicine, or excuse me, it doesn't take many calls in the middle of the night for your patient says, my primary care just called me, told me to go to the emergency room because my potassium is too high. And the emergency room said it was because of the drugs you prescribed. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, and and going to the emergency room in the middle of the night, like being told that you have a critical lab value that you need to go to the ER, is a terrifying thing for patients. Right, that's a traumatic experience that, that I don't want anybody to go through. And so, you know, do I think anybody's going to die of a cardiac arrest with a potassium of five point five? No, I don't. I think I think they're probably fine with it, but they still make you know a. If that's their floor, it's going to go up and down there and it might go up, yeah. it might go to six. And other doctors are going to tell them things that you may not have. And it's not unreasonable. I'm not saying that the, that the family practitioner is wrong, the primary care doctor is wrong to do that, but it is. And, you know, you don't want, you don't want, to, you don't want that to happen to your patient. And so I, and I just kind of look at, you know, what, what's the advantage of these drugs? These drugs are, you know, they're working on the margins, right? They're, you know, over five years is a 15% reduction of this composite outcome versus, you know, I had to go to the emergency room in the middle of the night. I try to avoid that as much as possible. And so I think I'm probably a little less brave than Jordy. I do see, you know, once you get to CKD stage four and you start slinging those mineral corticoreceptor antagonists, hyperkalemia is a real issue. And I do it, but I'm careful about it and I'm a little reluctant to it. And I talk to patients about the risk um, because it happens. You know, again, it's not so much that they're dying of cardiac arrest, but they do get hyperkalemia. So, you know, Paul, I don't know. Are you seeing patients on potassium binders to try to, like, I imagine they're being used to try to continue medications. Are you seeing that? I, I'm being, I've been seeing a fair amount of that in the past few years. I think a fair amount would be an overstatement, but I, I do see it often enough, um, certainly more than, than I used to. Yeah, where it's just the idea that these medications have enough benefit that it's worth adding another medication to control the side effects of the first medication that you added on. So so yes, is yeah. my long-winded answer. And, and yeah. I think the last time we talked about this, Joel, with you and, and the was during Enough Madness, we talked about hyperkalemia a few years ago. And where where has practice gone in the past two years with that? Are people finding the benefit of adding these, uh, you know, there's SCC, SPS, Petirimer, there's, there's all these, all these binders. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah. So the traditional binder was, um, uh, sodium polystyrene, so polystyrene sulfate. Something. Uh, and this SPS. was, um, <laughs> SPS, the, the, you know, the uh, trade name was uh, Kyanex or Kaxalate. Um, and this, this patient, this drug tastes terrible, gives patients pretty bad diarrhea and GI upset. Patients hate taking it. Um, and then there's two new binders that are really tasteless and easily tolerable for pretty long periods. There's one that's uh, sodium zirconium cyclosilicate, 
<laughs> Sorry, don't care. S- sodium zirconium <laughs> cyclosilicate, uh, which trade name is uh, Localma. And then there's um, uh, Petiramir, which is the trade name Veltessa. And again, both pretty well tolerated. Both work well to lower the potassium. Um, and they've definitely been marketed as drugs that allow you to keep patients on uh, these uh, RAS inhibition. So my first question, Matt, I'm, I'm, I'm really curious. Have you been seeing this come from cardiologists or from nephrologists? Is it people with heart failure or are you seeing it patients that have chronic kidney disease? I have a couple patients with chronic kidney disease that I have seen on, on this. Um, and I, I imagine it's because in some cases, I think it's just, they're just hyperkalemic from their chronic kidney disease and they're, you know, it's not necessarily, they're not saying we're, we're doing this to try to keep them on their, uh, you know, Valsartan or whatever. It's, yeah. I think it's just hyperkalemia. Yeah. I have, I have a few patients. And the re- the reason I ask is because I think the, the effectiveness of ACE inhibition in advanced heart failure is incredibly dramatic, right? It is, these are patients that otherwise would have months to live and you can really extend it out. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think about what patients go through to get a, an equivalent kind of survival benefit for cancer. And they will go through incredible side effects. Yeah. And this is way less than that. And so for advanced heart failure, I think it's a no-brainer. This is what it takes for them to stay on their ACE inhibitor. I would start it in a minute. Um, and then the, another patient I'm thinking of has really difficult to control hypertension. And their blood pressure comes right in line with um, a spironolactone, mineral corticoid receptor antagonist, sp- spiro. But they have hyperkalemia with that. And I really, I can't get their blood pressure controlled otherwise. And so I went with a uh, potassium binder in that situation, kind of felt like this was an easy call. And then after that, it's kind of been a few cases here and there, uh, patients that are particularly motivated, that are really kind of pushing me, is there anything else we can do? Is there anything else we can do? And I was like, well, we could, you know, they had already been intolerant to ACE, inhibitor, ACE inhibitors uh, before. And I was like, well, we can get you back on an ACE inhibitor if we use something to ma- monitor the potassium. And I've actually been surprised. Like, it doesn't take um, it doesn't take a binder every day. It doesn't take potassium every day. I usually can get by with three doses a week. Not always. It varies from patient to patient. And these are patients with GFRs. Typically, they were in less than 20. Um, and, I, and for me, I've been doing it when I can't get them on, like, kind of that first-level therapy, right? I can't even get them on an ACE inhibitor otherwise. And so I'm, I'm doing that. Or, and then the other people that I use on is that patients that are super reluctant to start dialysis and probably will never start dialysis. And so I'm facing patients with GFRs less than 10 that want conservative care. And so, okay, let's, we're, we're going to monitor. This is one thing that, that could off you is hyperkalemia. Okay, we'll use a drug here to prevent that. And, and there's no ACE inhibitor uh, in sight in those patients. We're already trying to avoid that completely. That's that's really helpful. Thank you. So it it's, it sounds like don't be cavalier about the hyperkalemia or if if the patient is hyperkalemic and they're going to see that H on their labs, you got to let the primary care doctor know and the patient know what you're doing if you're going to be trying to trying to keep him on an agent. And then if you're going to use a binder, you said it makes sense in heart failure because the the medications are just so beneficial to patients with heart failure that the it makes sense to try to keep those medications going. And same with resistant hypertension. You might use something like a spironolactone and patiromer to try to to try to even it out there. Yeah. And the the cost of these again, I think, is an issue. I've I've yeah. I've heard patients tell me, Yeah, my kidney doctor started me on this medicine. Do I really need it? Uh my and I'm like, Yes, your potassium is five point eight all the time. Uh, you know, like there's there's nothing else we could do to to bring that down right now. So I, yeah. The manufacturer of um, Petiromir tried to do a study called Diamond, and this was going to be a pretty, it was a pretty ambitious trial. This was um, uh, taking patients that had hyperkalemia and uh, and heart failure and randomizing them to either Petiromir or placebo with the intention that people in the Petiromir would be able to maintain their RAS inhibition and mineral corticoid receptor antagonists longer because they were on Petiromir rather than placebo. And the outcome was going to be cardiovascular mortality, right? They were going to truly answer the question, yeah. do these drugs allow you to live longer? And then there were, I don't know if you heard about this, there was this pandemic called COVID. 
<laughs> totally blew up the study, and and they just they bailed in the they bailed in the trial. They they saw enrollment plummet. They weren't able to get people to do follow up, and they changed the outcome to just changing potassium. And yes, these drugs do change the potassium, but to me, it kind of would have answered an un, like it makes. There's like this logical chain that you can follow. Oh, these these drugs help people with heart failure. So being able to maintain these drugs should make pay, people live longer, but. We don't know that, right? And it may be, right, if you could imagine people have a bell curve of aldosterone suppression when they're on a NACE inhibitor. And the people that get the most aldosterone suppression from that drug are going to be the patients that get the most hyperkalemia. Hmm. And those patients may not, they may need a smaller dose of ACE inhibition to get get the survival benefit. And fixing their potassium and keeping them on it may may not make a big difference. I don't, I don't know. That's kind of speculation. And that's why the trial is important, right? My point, I guess what I'm trying to say is that the people that develop hyperkalemia when they go on, uh, on RAS inhibition are not like everybody else. It's a minority of patients that get that side effect. And they may not have the same response to the drug. Hmm. And so it, 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 the Diamond trial, I really wish it had gone to completion. I think it would have been really interesting to see if it made a difference in, in the, but it ended up being like all the other trials and all we know is that these drugs do allow you to stay on the drugs longer and they give you better potassium control. We don't know if that translates into mortality benefit. So let's, let's say that uh, for, for Miss Houston, um, we have another part of the case here to sort of round things out for this CKD update. So we look at her basic metabolic panel. We notice she's actually has this chronic metabolic acidosis and her, her sodium is 140, potassium is 4.7, her chloride's 105, and her bicarb is 20 with an EGFR of 25. Tell us about metabolic acidosis uh, in CKD. Why is it important that we even pay attention to it? Yeah, so this has been an area of pretty intense research for a while now. Um, and one of the things that we, that we see is that uh, metabolic acidosis you know, the kidney has to respond by getting rid of that extra hydrogen. And when it does, that increases endothelin, angiotensin II, and aldosterone. And we have lots of lessons on all those hormones. They are cause problems in the kidney. They cause fibrosis and they cause nephron loss. And then you are left with less nephrons having to deal with the same metabolic acidosis. And so each nephron gets an even greater uh, uh, acid secretion burden. And this kind of seems like it's a self-perpetuating cycle that can damage the kidney. And so th- that's kind of the theoretical construct behind, well, why don't we treat this metabolic acidosis exogenously? Let's give patients alkali therapy to neutralize that metabolic acidosis and relieve the kidney of this burden. And, um, and before, but, but before we go one step further, like what we have here is a patient with chronic kidney disease and a low bicarb. And it, you want to reach for metabolic acidosis as the diagnosis, but you don't have a pH there. And you could also have respiratory alkalosis causing that same low bicarb. And so this has not been, you know, none of the trials that have tested, and we're going to talk about some of the trials that have been done, none of the trials required an ABG to be done because getting a blood gas in an outpatient clinic is like pulling teeth. It is so hard to do, right? <laughs> it's just not easy, right? You can send them to a lot of lab facilities and they're like, what are you talking about an ABG? I just, they just can't do it. Um, but <laughs> there is this, there's this trial that there's this study that I keep referencing. It's from, what's it from? It's from 1980 and it's 13 consecutive arterial blood gases from a single hospital. And what do you think the most common finding for, as the primary, primary acid-based disorder? I think you told, uh, was this metabolic alkalosis? It is from metabolic our, alkalosis. Yeah, half of them, half of them have metabolic alkalosis, Right. Which but is not what I would think. That's not which what is I would have not thought. What you would think. And that and that's and that is uh, and that's going to have an elevated bicarb. Uh, respiratory alkalosis was twice as common as metabolic acidosis, and both of those are going to have a decreased bicarb. Yeah, it's weird, right? It doesn't feel like it's bananas, right? It doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel right. But I, I just, and I will tell you that I regularly. In the hospital, see patients that are on bicarb. I said, "Oh, let's check an ABG because they're in the hospital. It's easy to get an ABG in the hospital." And uh, and sh- and it's shocking how often. 
oh, you're treating their respiratory alkalosis with bicarb. Stop doing that, <laughs> right? Don't do that. And so I just want to, before we go dive into this, the bicarb 20 doesn't necessarily mean metabolic acidosis. And even though they have chronic kidney disease, which causes metabolic acidosis, it still doesn't mean that. And take a moment, make sure you know what you're treating. Okay. That said, uh, there's been a, a few clinical trials. There's two uh, ones that are very frequently referenced, one out of London and one out of Italy. And both of them just gave patients oral bicarbonate for patients that had metabolic acidosis and CKD. They were CKD stage four, so GFR is less than 30. And uh, they had bicarbs from you know, 16 to 20 or 18 to 24 in the two trials. And both of them remar- resulted in remarkable slowing of the progression of chronic kidney disease really it re- reduced people going on dialysis. This is kind of the gold the gold ring that we're reaching for in the treatment of chronic kidney disease. Pretty dramatic results from both of these trials. The London trial is a single center, but the Italian one was multi-center. Uh, both of them were open label. And you can see in a long-term outpatient study, it's kind of difficult to do, keep people blinded, especially since everybody's always checking labs. Um, and so that's kind of that's the those are the best case scenarios. Those are the, the really the most dramatic results. There was a follow up study that was just done in elderly patients with chronic kidney disease in, in Great Britain, and this was multi center and double blinded. And um, here they didn't they they were mainly looking for quality of life improvements. They found no difference in any of the quality of life assessments leg strength or anything like that, and no difference in the initiation of dialysis. Now, it wasn't a GFR study. The GFR was not part of that study, but it is a. It is interesting that this um, blinded trial, randomized placebo-controlled blinded trial, didn't show any of the advantages of the earlier studies, which were open label, which is curious to say the least. And it's kind of one of the things that happened in that trial. There was nice separation at the start of the trial. Um, excuse me. Both pa- all the patients started with a uh, you know uh, an average GFR less than twenty two I think it was twenty in that study, and soon after starting it there was nice separation where people being treated had a higher bicarb than people that weren't treated. But by the end of the trial at twenty four months the difference had really collapsed, and it was almost as if the patients when they were enrolled they had kind of temporary metabolic acidosis and it kind of resolved on its own even in the placebo group, hmm. and that may have been the reason that uh, there was no difference at the, you know, in, in any of these outcomes is that you know, patients in the, in the placebo group just didn't need treatment. And it, it's unclear what, what was going on there, but it's, uh, it's curious. And that kind of that same thing happened in a, there was a drug called the Viramir. I don't think it's ever going to make it out. And this was a, um, we have phosphorus binders. This was a hydrogen ion binder, same idea, <laughs> right? And it was just going to bind up hydrogen and raise the bicarb that way. And um, in kind of early phase two trials, it worked great. And the FDA and the, the company said, hey, why don't you take a look at our phase two trials and give us approval? And the FDA is like, no, no, you need to do the phase three trial. And they went and did the phase three trial. And they had the kind of the same thing that I just described, where the patients in the placebo group and the patients in the vivirimer, there was just not good separation. Initially, they were far apart and they... They kind of came together on their own, and there was very little difference between the two groups and no difference in the outcome of the trial between the two groups. And again, that was also double-blinded. So this treatment of metabolic acidosis seems good. Um, I'm intrigued by it. I, I just, I'm a little nervous about the quality of the data. That it just, hmm. And I, I wonder if a lot of patients get started on these drugs kind of during a temporary stumble where their bicarb just drops down, but it kind of gets better on its own after that. And uh, maybe we don't need to constantly be treating these people. Once they start them, they don't need to be on for the rest of life, their life. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm, I'm, it, it, I think it's kind of a, the the history of this medicine is not as clear cut as you'd like it to be. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure if there's a big bicarb, but uh, the (laughs) it's bicarbonate, (laughs) 650 three times three times a day is a is is a typical dose so i kind of find that patients are so so compliant with this and maybe you know maybe sometimes the patients run this experiment for us whether or not they 
need to take it. You know, like you're, you're like, your your bicarb's 18. You, you you can ask them if they're taking it or not, but sometimes their bicarb, maybe they're not taking it at all and their bicarb normalizes and we're just like assuming they're taking it. it I, I wonder if that's happening. Yeah, uh, that, 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 may, that may be going on. Um, and, and I'll tell you, I don't think this drug is as easy as as tolerable as you may think. Like patients get dyspepsia from this drug. It causes a lot of burping. It can cause an upset mm-hmm. stomach. Like people don't love taking that bicarb pill. But there's not been mortality benefits shown with any of these trials. I mean, I know that's not something that's been looked at, but it's really the progression to the progression of the renal disease, but they've not actually shown sort of other, like, I don't want to call them harder outcomes, but you've not seen mortality benefit in these studies in so much as I know. Is that fair to say? That the UBI trial, which was the um, Italian multi-center trial, did have. Can you give me a moment? I'm just gonna. I want to pull up that data so I can take a look at that. Yeah. So they did show a mortality benefit. The placebo group had a 6.8 percent mortality, and the bicarb group had a 3.1 percent mortality. Oh. And they also showed a reduction in hospital days. 3,220 hospital days, I think it must be cumulative for the trial, versus uh, 1,990 in the bicarb group. Yeah, I'd hope not per patient. That would be bad. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I mean, I, yes, the, the, the UB trial, which was this um, uh, multi-center trial in Italy, shows phenomenal results. And the London trial showed really good results, but kind of subsequent, and there was just actually just um, last week was a trial in transplant patients. Also, was they were looking at um, citrate, um, sodium citrate as their alkali and no benefit there. And again, no big difference in the bicarb at the end of the trial. I, I'm, I really wonder if we kind of uh, uh, overshoot this and treat, and treat people that don't need treatment. So... What, what I think, uh, th- this is always tested on the internal medicine boards. Uh, you know, I, I imagine it'll stay on there and, unless there's ever definitive data. They always like to ask, you know, give you the patient with the diabetic kidney disease and mild metabolic acidosis, and then they, they want you to put them on bicarb. But It's in, in the guidelines. They tell yeah. you to do it. Yeah. And it, it, more practically speaking, Paul and I struggle with getting most of our patients to just eat healthy foods. Um, and there's lots of reasons for that. I know that Joel, you, you told us like you, you sort of opened my eyes to thinking about like, okay, patients admitted to the hospital for two days. Does it really matter if they're eating a cardiac diet or, you know, why they're, they're going to eat whatever they want at home. The kidney diet for patients with CKD is particularly hard to follow. Where where are you at with that now and how does that relate to metabolic acidosis? Yeah, so the renal diet is a uh, is, is a low sodium, low potassium, low phosphorus diet and there are some patients where that's real important. I mean, patients with advanced CKD and they they or um, or dialysis and there's a there's real issues where you're just trying to avoid toxicity from those ions and you're trying to decrease the amount of work that the kidney does. But the vast majority of people with chronic kidney disease have no trouble staying in in electrolyte balance. They're not fighting hyperkalemia. Their phosphoruses are reasonable. Um, but there's uh, there's this kind of body of evidence um, kind of led by a, a woman named um, Nimrat Gar- Garoya uh, down at Baylor Scott & White in Texas. And she was looking at some... Uh, data for kidney stones. And the the kidney stone data was looking at kind of the renal acid load of different foods. And she noticed, hey, fruits, vegetables, these have negative acid potential. They actually, they're alkali by nature. They're going to neutralize some of the natural acid. And she's like, well, what if we just gave patients diets rich in fruits and vegetables, which is, I know, a radical consideration, <laughs> right? Someone should look at fruits and vegetables. <laughs> people should think about this. Fruits and vegetables, wild to think that they may be good for you, but this is what this is her theory. And she's compared this to sodium bicarbonate, and it's about as effective as sodium bicarbonate at maintaining GFR. And she is, she's partnered with a food co-op. Like her studies are, we deliver the fruits and vegetables to the patients. This is a lot more than just saying, hey, eat an apple every so often, right? <laughs> Maybe have a salad tomorrow, right? They're giving the patients the food. And and not only these patients are, their, their uh, blood pressure is going down, their weight's going down, their cholesterol is getting better, and their metabolic acidosis is being treated. Yeah, right? This is exactly what you want to do. Yeah. We need to get this 
person fixing school lunches too. I've been ranting to Paul about those. So uh, yeah, you replace <laughs> the French toast. Replace the French toast sticks with some uh, fruits and vegetables. <laughs> So yeah, that's a that's a real interesting uh, area uh, of area of study, and there there's some extension studies that are being doing done elsewhere um, that are coming up, and this this is this is real promising. So it sounds like unless the patient's already struggling with hyperkalemia, you're not really telling the patient to stop or or on dialysis. You're not telling them that they really have to change their diet. They should still eat what we would consider a you know, a diet that incorporates fruits and vegetables, like we would tell most of any of our other patients. Yeah, that that's exact. That's exactly right. Okay, I know the car. We always get carnivore comments anytime we mention fruits and vegetables. Now, but even from other doctors, which is, uh, you know, uh, I'm not ready to give up on fruits and vegetables yet. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not hating <laughs> you on <radical>. meat. <laughs> I'm not hating on meat. Uh, I, I have nothing, I know nothing against meat, but, uh, I, I do think fruits and vegetables still have a place, uh, in, in the, in, in diet. What, what world are we living in? I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, this, Joel, this has been fantastic. If people want to hear other episodes on CKD, Joel, episode 67 and episode 69 of Curbsiders was a, were CKD shows with you. And that was, by the time this airs, this is like 380 something. So this is, yeah, long 300 plus episodes ago. Uh, you've been on the show. I think your first appearance was episode 32. So you're just, yeah. Which is kind of a CKD hypertension. It was just kind of like talk about kidney stuff. (laughs) Yeah. We talked about, we talked about med Twitter. You, you sort of predicted med Twitter, which has become, you know, a big, became a big thing, like within the next couple of years of that, of that episode, um, which, which at the time I hadn't even really, it wasn't even on my radar. So yeah. Uh, we've done a lot of learning with you over the years, Joel, but, uh, for now, can you can you tell the audience a, a couple take home points from what we've discussed tonight? SGLT twos, finerenone, um, the binders, the metabolic acidosis, any of that that you wanted to comment on? Well, what I'd say is that SGLT two inhibitors have suffered from nobody taking ownership of them. Right? These came in as diabetes drugs, and they're not very good diabetes drugs. And the cardiologist wanted to defer to the primary care doctor, and the nephrologist is nervous about putting on anybody on a hypoglycemic own the SGLT2 inhibitors. Make a difference for your patients. These are drugs that prevent them from being hospitalized for heart failure, prevent them from dying of cardiac disease, slow the progression of kidney disease, and avoid them from dying of kidney disease. This this is a no-brainer. Take the bull by the horns, start these medications, stop fearing these drugs. These are great medications, and they're easily tolerated. You're going to ask patients, how this pill going? They're like, yeah, I'm not having any trouble with it. Okay. Um, And then don't worry about it. You, uh, GFR can fall. It's not. It's it's. It, you don't need to stop the drugs. There's not going to be an in, in toxic, a toxicity that's going to emerge from these drugs at low GFR. And in fact, it's going to lower their potassium. It's going to prevent them from developing hyperkalemia. It's going to prevent them from developing acute kidney injury. It's going to keep them out of the hospital. It's a win. Finerenone we talked about. This is the the non steroidal uh, middle corticoid receptor antagonist. This probably is going to have a role in your diabetics. It may have a role. They're running a trial now in non-diabetics. We That results are not in. But patients that have residual proteinuria after you've done everything you could do, you've put them on an ACE or ARB, you got them on an SGLT2 inhibitor, you've got their blood pressure controlled, they still have proteinuria, they're looking at dialysis sometime in the you know down the road, you know, especially that patient who's you know 50 years old. And you're like, well, what's their runway for kidney disease? You're like, well, they got 30 years to go. I mean, if they have accelerated loss of kidney function, they're going to end up there. And you're going to want to try to avoid that. And I think this is something that could, should be considered there. Um, but you got to be careful of the potassium. Remember, even in the trial where they did everything they could to prevent the patients from developing hyperkalemia, they had 20% of patients get hyperkalemia. You got to be make them aware of it. You need to be aware of it. Watch for it. We talked about potassium binders. These are super useful in select patients. You're going to want to be able to deploy these to keep these patients on other therapies. Um, we don't have the definitive data yet. It may come, it may never come, but this is a useful tool you should have in your in your uh, toolbox. And then lastly, we talked about treating metabolic acidosis. And I guess what I would say is one, 
Uh, it's the right answer on boards. If they got metabolic acidosis, <laughs> <laughs> two, if the metabolic acidosis isn't too bad and they don't have a problem with hyperkalemia, have me to carry it every now and then. That may, that may get you where you need to be. Put, give them some fruit juice, some vegetable juice. Uh, and, um, you know, nephrology is scary and it doesn't have to be. It's not that hard. Okay. Uh, you can, you can do this. Yeah, especially if they listen to all like 20 <laughs> Joltoff Curbsiders episodes and the, and the Freely Filtered podcast. You could, you could do worse than listening to curb, probably, all the Curbsiders episodes. This has been another episode of the Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy. Get your show notes at thecurbsiders.com. And while you're there, sign up for our mailing list to get our weekly show notes in your inbox. Plus, twice each month, you'll get our Curbsiders Digest, recapping the latest practice-changing articles, guidelines, and news in internal medicine. And we're committed to high-value practice-changing knowledge, and we want your feedback. So please subscribe, rate, and review the show. Uh, You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube. You can also send an email to askcurbsiders at gmail.com. A reminder that this and most episodes are available for CME through VCU Health at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. I wanted to give a special thanks to our writer and producer for this episode, Malini Gandhi, who unfortunately for technical difficulties couldn't join us on air for this one, um, but did great work. And also, uh, the Curbsiders is produced and edited by the team at Podpaste. Elizabeth Proto and Jen Watto run our social media. Stuart Brigham composed our theme music. And Paul, with all that, until next time, I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. And as always, I remain Dr. Paul Nelson-Williams. Thank you and goodbye. Goodbye.